Well, we're going to talk some about these sort of long-term studies of VEGF inhibition use, and we have a variety of them that are available to us. Um, many of them are uh, both a, a, a either a PRN or a sort of a capped PRN approach, and we'll talk about the differences in those as we go through them. But this slide kind of it illustrates the number of patients that have been looked at through the variety of studies back all the way from 2012 to even more recently in the RANGE study. And we'll talk about what those study results are, are mean as far as the results go. But let's start off, uh, Diana, if you, if you could, with the 7UP study and describe it to us a little bit and tell us about what it found. Sure. I'm happy to give a little brief overview of the 7UP study. This was a seven-year outcome study to evaluate the long-term effects of ranibizumab in eyes with neovascular AMD. And many of the patients who were in the 7UP study were actually initially in the Anchor study, Marina, or Horizon study. And it involved 14 centers, and it looked at almost eight years of follow-up. 65 patients were included, and the primary outcome was looking at the percentage of patients who had a visual acuity of 2070 or better after eight years. Secondary outcomes included the mean change in letter score and anatomic results on both fluorescein angiography and OCT. And what were the results of the study? Well, the results were a little bit surprising, actually. They showed that after a mean of about seven years of follow-up, only 37% of eyes actually had a visual acuity of 2070 or better. And the majority, actually 37% of those eyes enrolled, had a final visual acuity of 2200 or worse. So this surprised retina specialists because we thought that anti-VEGF therapy would be a wonderful treatment, especially the longer you followed up patients and the longer you treated patients. Mm -hmm. So Lloyd, you know, there are a couple points about the study which I think are quite interesting. The first is the, the mean number of injections was about 6.8 during that three to four year interval. Is that on par with what you're doing in clinical practice, or do you think these patients were slightly undertreated? Well, I think now we know. I think based on some of our uh, information we've learned from uh, trials after 7-Up uh, and some of the other claims data that's been published, that two injections a year in the chronic phase is probably insufficient therapy. So I do believe that these patients uh, were undertreated relative to the information that we have today. And, and what about the, the idea, Quan, that this could be just selection bias, right? Because these are the patients who have been followed for so long, who have not been as good as far as outcome. Do you think that that had something to do with this result? Well, or? if we just have only the data from the 7-Up, then one may say, yes, this could be some bias in, uh, in terms of selection patient. But as Lloyd just mentioned, some of the GLAM data and someone, for example, like Nancy Hollacham has present some of this data already indicating that whether or not con uh, consciously or unconsciously for both the patient and the physician because of the burden of treatment, both tend to be maybe under treated patient because the use, the data claim from the, the use of antivetchup clearly show that we probably should be using treating the patient more than that. Now, certainly sometimes the patient thought that the vision seems to be stable, they will miss the visit and sometimes the uh, clinician office may have too many patients, too many injections, so they don't necessarily always follow the regimen. But certainly, uh, we now practicing in level one medicine, certainly this uh, data help us to recognize that, uh, no, we still have to really pay attention because otherwise we may end up with the seven up study outcome, which is not say so good for the patient. So Diana, you know, when, when you take this into clinical practice, uh, one of the things I always think about when I see data like this is, how you discontinue therapy in patients. And maybe it's for good reasons and bad reasons. So for, and bad reasons, it might be because, you know, they don't, they have poor vision and you're just talking about whether the injections matter. Yeah. And in the good vision patient, you're just really wondering if you rest the disease. How do you do that? How do you discontinue therapy with your patients in your own practice now? Well, I think for me, I only discontinue therapy if there is no sign of activity. And so if there is signs of activity, edema, subretinal fluid on OCT, I tell them that the evidence shows that treatment is better in those situations. And if they decline treatment, I warn them about the loss in vision that can occur. One of the most surprising things also about 7-Up was this idea that macular atrophy was detected in patients with fundus autofluorescence. So we have a reason to expect why their visual acuity might have dropped is that we're having patients with macular atrophy. And so we'll talk maybe a little bit more about how we might introduce anti-VEGF and anti 
uh, complement drugs potentially in the future and in a couple more slides. So this, this slide just shows you again the mean change in visual acuity over time, the changes of about 19 letters as Diana pointed out from the baseline, uh, from, from the time of the greatest visual acuity actually. And this is actually the change in, in the BCVA letters in those patients during the course of the study. So, uh, and we, we talked a little bit about drug selection also as potentially the one. Do you think if that had any effect in this case, we used ranibizumab in this study, is that, uh, how do we feel about that compared to other anti-VEGFs that are available? Do you think, Lloyd, there was any indication that ranibizumab had some effect here? So, you know, my sense is the issue here is under treatment, meaning disease, uh, unchecked disease activity. And I think so I think that's the primary issue here is not so much drug selection, but really whether or not the patient has chronic active disease for a long period of time. Now you could, you could argue back and forth in the chronic uh, stages of the disease if there's differences in the two drugs. But I think in terms of ranibizumab and aflibercept, I think we now have a pretty decent understanding that um, in the acute phase of therapy for large groups of patients, these two drugs are relatively equivalent. Mm -hmm. And the key is to, uh, is to keep the disease as quiet as possible. Mm -hmm. I think we can't forget either that bevacizumab is a great option too. And you know, the CAT study showed us that bevacizumab, when dosed in a similar regimen compared to ranibizumab, can also be very effective in vision gains. And of course, the benefit with bevacizumab is the lower cost. And at least we didn't see differences in the two drugs at the, the five-year interval between the two. I mean, the CAT five-year data is out there. We know that there's no difference in the anti-VEGF, at least for those two drugs. So you'd think it wouldn't be actually anti-VEGF. I do, do agree with you that under treatment's probably the reason for what we saw here in general.